So now that we have described the classification of wounds and we've discussed the concept of partial versus full thickness wounds and the staging of pressure injuries, I'd like to now move on and talk about the concept of wound healing. As clinicians uh, providing wound care at the bedside, it's, really un it's very, very important that we have a good understanding of what healing entails. Because one of the things that's very important is when you are assessing a wound, it is really helpful to try to determine um, not only for your documentation, but also for determining treatment strategies, what phase of healing that wound is in. So when we talk about wound healing, um, it is very important to understand that partial thickness wounds heal differently than full thickness wounds. Partial thickness wounds heal by a process that we refer to as regeneration. And again, if you have a break in the skin surface that has not penetrated the dermal layer, um, it is very easy, for the most part, for that tissue to regenerate. You have not destroyed the extracellular matrix, and for the most part, what that requires is just re-epithelialization or resurfacing of the wound. Great examples in point, uh, the patient that develops, um, again, maybe a small superficial uh, abrasion. Um, it heals very nicely. There is no scarring. We say that that is a wound that is healed by regeneration. Regeneration does not result in scarring, and that is how partial thickness wounds will heal. So if you have a stage 2 pressure injury, for example, and you have initiated an appropriate plan of care and that patient uh, ends up healing, that process was regeneration, and you'll see that there really is no appreciable scarring for that type of wound. Another reason why it is so compelling to try to identify and aggressively treat your wounds as soon as possible. Your full thickness wounds, however, they heal by a process referred to as tissue repair. And usually full thickness wounds involve fairly extensive tissue damage. So it takes a lot more resources for the body to be able to uh, pull those resources to go ahead and heal that wound. And wounds that heal through the process of tissue repair will typically result in what we can identify as scar formation. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as we discuss these phases. Um, so when you are looking at a wound, an important part of your wound assessment is to try to determine, if you're able to, what stage of tissue repair uh, that wound is in. And there are several key phases that the wound has to move through in order to successfully heal or close. And these are referred to as uh, hemostasis or inflammation, proliferation, and maturation or remodeling. Now, in some wound care literature sources, hemostasis and inflammation are sometimes addressed separately. Um, in this other resources, they are sometimes addressed concurrently. Many of the processes occur in a fairly close time frame, but we will talk about both of those as we go on. The important thing to keep in mind is that a wound has to progress systematically through all of these phases of healing in order for closure or healing to occur. So with hemostasis and inflammation, it is very important to keep in mind that when there is an injury or trauma of some sort to the host, and this could be either a traumatic wound, pressure injury, vascular ulcer of some sort, typically what happens is that the immediate response in the host is, is an effort to try to stop the damage, to control the damage and to stop the bleeding. So what happens initially is that there is vasoconstriction that goes on in the wound. And again, this is to try to reduce the amount of blood flow going to the site of injury. Once vasoconstriction occurs, we now have the uh, activation of the clotting cascade. You have the intrinsic and extrinsic factors that come together and ultimately cause uh, fibrinogen, which is a soluble protein in the blood, to be converted into fibrin, which is an insoluble protein. And this fibrin basically forms uh, a series of threads or, or a net, if you will. And the fibrin will catch the platelets and form a uh, platelet plug, or what we sometimes will refer to as fibrin clots. And the fibrin clots are basically fibrin and platelets together that have come to ward off that blood flow to stop the bleeding and to try to stabilize things. We refer to that as hemostasis. And that's actually considered to be the point at which healing occurs. 
because within those platelets in that fibrin clot or that fibrin plug, there are actually growth factors, very rich growth factors that are referred to as platelet-derived growth factor alpha, alpha, and beta, beta. And as that clot matures, um, the platelets will eventually degranulate and they will pour out growth factors into that wound bed to help facilitate healing. That is the very first component of this first phase of wound healing, and that is hemostasis. Once the damage control has been done, the bleeding has been stopped, and the bleeding is controlled, we now have a process called vasodilatation. And this is when we have all of these vasoactive substances, things like histamine and bradykinins and prostaglandins that come into the environment and they actually create uh, vasodilatation of the blood vessels in that area surrounding that tissue injury. And the purpose for that is to now bring more blood into that area and along with it a series of important cellular players that we refer to as neutrophils and macrophages. And the basic purpose of these neutrophils or macrophages, which are basically specialized white blood cells, is to really come in and engulf the, uh, any bacteria or foreign bodies or any type of undesirable material that happens to be in that wound. So they're really the, the janitors or the cleanup crew, if you want to think about that. And their whole purpose is to remove the bacteria and foreign debris and to get this wound ready to move into the next phase of wound healing. I really like to think about the uh, hemostasis and the inflammatory phase kind of like a house. We have a very, very active uh, process going on. We have a lot of inflammation. And when we think about inflammation, we're always thinking about things like warmth, redness, tenderness, heat. And all of those are some of the classic signs and symptoms that we see. This is just a, a good way to put this into your mind in terms of what you would think about when you are looking at the inflammatory phase of wound healing. And again, this is, a, this is usually a period that lasts anywhere from 48 to 72 hours. And it is normal and expected to see things like redness, tenderness, and warmth in a wound during this particular phase. Once we have gone through the inflammatory phase, we are now ready to move into what we refer to as the proliferation stage. This is a very, very active stage. Again, this will, in a normal situation, start at about 48 to 72 hours after the inflammatory phase. And this is a very active phase, as I mentioned, where now the macrophages, those very specialized white cells that we were describing, um, become very, very um, important. They are, uh, if you want to think about it, sort of the, the foreman of the construction crew. They mediate the release of multiple various growth factors. And the growth factors really have two main responsibilities. They will result in the development of new endothelial cells. And when we talk about endothelial cells, those are the um, cells that basically are responsible for creating new blood vessels. So the endothelial cells are responsible for a process called neoangiogenesis, which is just making new red blood vessels, making new little capillaries. The other thing that the uh, macrophages are responsible for is they will stimulate the activity of fibroblasts. Fibroblasts are very specialized cells that will migrate into the wound during the proliferative phase of wound healing. And they are very responsible for the deposition of collagen. And the collagen and the new red blood vessels, the neoangiogenesis and the collagen formation, together um, make up what we refer to as granulation tissue. And you can see in this particular example on your left that this is a wound that has good, healthy, viable granulation. It should be beefy red, red velvet in appearance. Uh, very, very viable. And this is, again, a process that may take, it may take days to weeks, sometimes even months, depending on how healthy the patient is, the location of the wound, um, how accurate or adequate their blood supply is. There are a number of different factors that can affect the rate at which this proliferation will occur. But during this process, it is a very, very active time, and the body is actively trying to create new tissue, granulation tissue, to fill in this hole, if you will, this defect in the skin, to try to fill it up and to restore the integrity. That's the whole purpose of proliferation.
And again, a good analogy to think about is we, it's a building process. We are, again, trying to deposit um, our new capillary system, so that's our plumbing to feed the tissue, and then we're putting up walls and structures. That's our collagen. So the two together make up what we refer to as granulation tissue. Now, towards the end of the proliferation phase, once that wound has now filled in, that granulation tissue has filled in, we now need to do something about covering that open wound because even though it's filled in and gotten smaller, it's still open. So now we have to look at what's referred to as reepithelialization. This is where, again, the growth factors are very important and they play a very, very important role. They facilitate the migration of keratinocytes across the wound surface. What are keratinocytes? They are also referred to as epithelial cells. They're very specialized little cells. They often will come in and migrate from the hair follicles near a peri wound. And what these do is these basically will come out and resurface. They will start to migrate and spread across the surface of that wound for the purposes of reepithelializing or recovering that wound. Again, a good way to think about this is we've got the house that's now been built, but we need to put something on the exterior of the house to cover it and protect it. And so now we are looking at a re-epithelialization process. Now typically, a lot of clinicians, once we get to the end of this process and we see that this wound has now closed and it's got this very nice new layer of epithelial tissue covering it, sometimes we think to ourselves, well, the wound is, is it's healed, it's closed. Well, it may be closed, but it hasn't completely finished the healing process. And that brings us to the next phase of healing, which is what we call maturation, or sometimes it's called remodeling. Either one, you'll see both of those in the literature. This is where that collagen that was initially deposited goes through a period of remodeling. It is broken down, and it is rebuilt, and it is restructured. And the whole purpose of this is over time to help increase the tensile strength of that wound and to help maintain tissue integrity. And what we see here is basically um, a scar. Now, maturation and remodeling can continue for a period of up to two years after the uh, wound is actually closed. So even though the wound may appear to be healed, it is still healing, um, sometimes up to two years after the fact. When you have a process where a wound has healed by tissue repair, you often will have a scar. And as you can appreciate, the scar does not have the same normal integrity that regular tissue does. It is much more friable. It will not have hair follicles or cells. It may be hypo or hyperpigmented in relationship to the surrounding skin. And it's only going to have about 80% of the original tensile strength of the original tissue. And that's very important because if you think about a patient who develops a pressure injury, for example, and that wound heals, uh, we have a wound that has a, a very uh, intact scar, but that scar is only about 80% as strong as the original tissue. So if that patient develops a new area or a new pressure injury or traumatic injury even to that same area and that wound heals, you can see that over time that wound is going to become less and less strong, that scar is going to become more and more friable, and each time it's going to have less and less tensile strength, so it's going to be very difficult for it to heal. I think about as a really good example is when you have a patient who has a spinal cord injury. They're very susceptible to developing uh, pressure injuries in the same areas time and time again. And over time, as each of those ulcers or injuries develops, it becomes uh, very, very difficult and challenging to heal those pressure injuries. So a good way to think about remodeling, uh, a good analogy is uh, where you have, for example, this scar and this scar looks like it's okay, but it really just needs to be jazzed up. It needs to be made better, faster, stronger. So that's the whole remodeling. That's trying to improve upon what you already have to improve the tensile strength to allow that scar to be able to withstand further trauma. But as I mentioned, keep in mind that a wound who, that is healed by a process of tissue repair is going to heal by scar formation, and that that scar formation is only going to be about 80% as good as new. So if we can prevent these injuries, that's really the, the ultimate crux for us.